So as Aaron mentioned, uh, we're going to be hearing some of Jesus' teachings, stories, parables over the course of the summer at Elmhurst CRC, and in my opinion, they're some of the best parts of the Bible. Um, The parable for today is sometimes called the parable of the talents, sometimes called the parable of the ten minas. What does that even mean if you're an American? Sometimes it's called the parable of the pounds. Uh, Frankly, I like to call it the parable of the piles of cash. Okay? So a couple things in the background of this story. Um, Jesus often told stories about money. And it was not his way of collecting funds or getting people to donate things, but Jesus knew this. When you tell a story about money, it gets people's attention because you know what people like? Money, (laughs) right? So if you want to quickly sort of get to somebody's values, tell a story about cash or money. Jesus does this time and time again. The stories are about money, but at the end of the day, they are not about money. Know what I'm saying? Jesus said this, where a person's treasure lies, that's where their heart is also. And Jesus is interested in getting to the bottom of our hearts. So we tell stories about money. Um, Today, the story you're about to hear, the parable, is gonna come from Luke chapter 19. And right before Jesus tells this parable, Um, An amazing scene unfolds. Jesus is walking uh, the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, and he happens across this tax collector in the ancient world named Zacchaeus, who we know is a diminutive guy. Zacchaeus has a lot of money. No one likes him because the way Zacchaeus got rich was kind of by overcharging everybody else in the community. And Jesus sees Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, bro, I'm having lunch at your house today. And through this encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus' life totally changes, and he makes solemn vows to share his wealth and to pay back everybody he's ever wronged. And Jesus says this after Zacchaeus' response, salvation has come to this house today. And if you were a person in that community and you were kind of expecting a Messiah to show up, and then you saw this tax collector's life change, you would fairly conclude, wow, if salvation is coming to this guy's house, salvation is coming soon for all of us. And 2,000 years ago, that would have meant liberty from the Roman Empire, freedom for Israel, a great new day coming. There was a ton of expectation. While that scene was unfolding, Jesus told the parable of the piles of cash. You with me? All right, here's my personal confession today. Um, I am kind of like half a bubble off as a human being. Do you ever have days where you wake up in the morning and you're like not quite right? Um, so that is like me right now. So if anything, if I say anything really dumb today, <laughs> cut me extra grace, okay? Or if my energy starts flagging, It's because I'm just a weak human being like you. Here's the thing I'm excited about, though. God's word and the scriptures and Jesus' teaching. Okay, so you might need to look behind the person harder than usual today. That's all I'm saying, okay? So here's Jesus' parable, the first part. While everybody was still listening to this, Salvation has come to this house today. Zacchaeus has turned the corner. Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Again, they are hopeful. Things are going to change. Jesus said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them each, modern math, $40,000. And the master said, put this money to work until I come back. Notice in the background of the story, there's a man, maybe we would say a politician, 
a person of influence, who is about to take a trip to see if they might be appointed king and then come back to the community. So we have politicians who campaign, right? They go out there, they see if they're gonna win the vote, and then maybe they come back and maybe they're a senator, maybe they're a representative, maybe they're a president. In the ancient world, it was under Roman rule, and this literally happened in Israel for King Herod the Great. If you've been around church around Christmas time, probably you've heard of King Herod the Great. Herod himself took a trip from Israel to Rome to meet with the Caesar to see if he could be the king. And he was approved by Caesar, and Herod came back and was the king for a good long time. Herod's son, Archelaus, in 4 BC, made a similar trip from Israel to Rome to see if he would be appointed to rule as king over Israel. He ended up being rejected and was not the king of the community. So everybody who would have been hearing Jesus' story would have heard this little background and been like, well, of course, that's how it works. You kind of leave the country, you go to Rome, you see if the Caesar blesses you, and then you come back and you're king or not. Do you get the picture? It's a little weird for us. So when this person of influence is about to leave the community, he finds 10 top servants, and while he's away, gives them an investment. And the whole point of this is to see how they will publicly represent the person seeking to be king while they're away. Will they be faithful to him? Will they use the money wisely? Will they promote his cause to be king? Again, it's a little strange for us. Everybody who heard this story 2,000 years ago would have instantly known what it was about. So here's the question. Is the person in Jesus' story, as they leave, are they going to come back and be king or not? This is the, kind of the first drama in the story. Jesus continues. Some of this person of influence subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, will you be the delegation? We don't want this man to be our king. But he was made king. He got Caesar's blessing, however, and then returned home. Then he sent for the servants whom he had given those piles of money in order to find out what they had done with it. So not too dissimilar from today, not all political candidates are supported by everybody. Have you noticed this? Please, right. So this person of influence makes the trip to see Caesar, and immediately in his departure, the wake of his departure, there is a delegation of people who are like, actually, we hate this guy, and he should not be king. All right? So he is not universally acclaimed, approved of, but in fact, Caesar blesses him, and he comes back. How's it going to go for everybody? The first of the servants. Can we go to the next slide, Bill? Awesome. If you would be the voice of the various servants. The first servant came and said, Sir, your 40,000 has earned 400,000 more. I would like to know who, like, can we get this guy to be our investment advisor? Like, this is not a long period of time, maybe half a year or something. The new king says, well done, my good servant. Because you have been trustworthy or faithful in a small matter, take charge of 10 cities, because now I'm the king of this whole area. The second servant came and said, sir, your 40,000 has earned 200,000 more. And his master answered to that servant, well, you take charge of five cities. Notice that the new king does not say, this is awesome, that's so much money, thank you very much. He says, well done, you've been trustworthy and faithful, and now I'm gonna give you more responsibility. He does not say, I'm going to trust you as my lord of the treasurer, this is not about money, it's about faithfulness. He says, I am going to give you responsibility for 10 cities. 
because I trust you. I'm going to give you responsibility for five cities because you have been faithful. It's really easy to think Jesus is just telling a story about the multiplication of cash. And in fact, we're Americans. We have, I would say, the blessing of living in a capitalist economy. That meaning we live in a country where trade and industry are controlled privately and for profit. This was not the case when Jesus told the story. So when we you know, read back our modern capitalist perspective on this story, we immediately go wrong. This is not a story about multiplying money. It's a story about whether servants will be faithful to the master even while the master is away and even while they don't know whether the master is going to become king or not. Can you feel the difference? Now, I would put it this way. Jesus is a king. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, all creation. For a short time, he was here on planet earth in the flesh. He's still here by his spirit. But Jesus is not here in the flesh right now, but he has promised to be a king who is coming to return. We don't talk about that so often, but we profess this. I believe this down to my toes. Jesus is coming back as a king. And the question in front of all of us today is, are we going to be like these faithful servants do we want to be like these faithful servants who have been entrusted with an investment, not just money, an investment of the Creator's gifts, and will we be found faithful? So God trusts us or gives all kinds of different amounts of financial resources. Compared to the average person on planet Earth, we are all rich. Like that much is true, but in this room, we have people who are struggling to make the rent and pay the bills this month. We have people who are going to need help to pay the bills even in this coming months. We have people who are super successful business leaders and entrepreneurs who sometimes struggle not knowing what to do with the massive liquidity of financial resources that they have. I've had this conversation with people, like it can be a problem. How to faithful, we're all over the map in this room, right? But the question is still the same. Are we going to be faithful or not? And again, this is not about cash. Here's what I know. To every single man, woman, and kid in this room, God has given a unique set of gifts, talents, educational experiences, aptitudes, things that you're interested in, things that you're good at, habits, things that people look at you and are like, how did you get so good at that? Like your gifts, and this to me is the heart of the story, with what God has given you in particular, how can you live in a way that is faithful? And how can you live in a way that publicly represents King Jesus here and now with your gifts so that when he comes back someday, he will look at all of us and say, good job, you guys. I gave you a little bit of a gift and you multiplied it like crazy. So these prayer shawls, like I would say knitting is a gift. I've tried to learn how to knit different times. I'm really not very good at it. Some people are amazing at it. And a way of maybe modestly using that gift would be just knit yourself a sweater, knit yourself some gloves, knit your family members some blankets. We have knitters here who have a mission to knit for other people to multiply the gift that they've been given. Isn't that beautiful? Right? We have people here who have extreme mathematical gifts, finance gifts, accounting gifts. And it'd be one thing if you grew up to be an accountant who was, you know, in the vein of Scrooge and Marley. Right? You have all the gifts, but you just are hoarding 
that gift and, and the resources that it produces for yourself. We have tons of gifted accountants in this room who serve on nonprofit boards, who have been the treasurers of Elmhurst Christian Reformed Church, who use their gift of a well-organized mind for the betterment of the world. And someday Jesus is gonna come back and be like, hey accountants, Christian accountants, who are living publicly for me, like, good job, you guys. I'm gonna trust you with even more. Musical gifts, gifts of mercy. I, I mean, the list of gifts are endless. What Jesus is asking of us today is to examine those gifts and to wonder, am I publicly representing Jesus in a way that honors the master before the master returns? That's God's question, I believe at the heart of Jesus' parable for you today. And Jesus wants the answer, spoiler alert, to be yes, yes, yes. And Jesus wants to meet you in the middle of deploying your gift, because here's what I know happens. I mean, just to speak about our musicians, I can relate to them a little bit. When you use your musical gift for the sake of other people and can serve an entire church that is like singing out and praising God together, that is infinitely better than just like practicing scales at home. <laughs> like it's a next level thing. When you give yourself away, it gives you joy. And when you use your spiritual gift in a community and you get good feedback and God honors it, do you wanna give more or less? Anybody? <laughs> like more, please. And sometimes like, you're a musician, you're just playing, and then you recognize like, maybe there's things beyond my music that I could do too. Maybe I could find a way to help with kids. And if you're giving God back, honoring Jesus with the gift of your time and your talents, you know what naturally follows and is even easier? Like writing a check. Like for most people in the, this room, time is your most valuable resource, and if you are generously giving and experiencing the joy of God, why would you want to hoard all your resources? Because you recognize like, wow, when I share in every portion of my life, it's more fun. It blesses the community, it blesses the world, and it brings more joy in, into our lives. So um, in everybody's worship folder today, uh, there's a little card that says, put me in coach because we are not smart enough as a church staff, as elders, as deacons. We have something called the 10 talent team that kind of keeps their thumb on the pulse of kind of the gifts and the creativity of the congregation. Here's what I know. There are tons of hidden and secret talents in this room right now that it would be amazing to see deployed to honor the master and bring more public uh, honor to Jesus. If what I just said spoke to you, or you're like, actually, I have this thing in my life that I would love to share, but I just don't know how to do it. When we take an offering at the end of this message, fill this out and write something on the back about what your talent or gift or interest is and put that in the offering, and we will get back to you. Like, we, we wanna see all the good gifts that our Creator has given put into the service of Jesus. So this is the good news part of the message. Um, there's more to Jesus' story, and it's not all good news from here on out, because not everybody makes the choice to honor the king while the king's away. Here's what happens next. Then another servant, remember the master gave 10 different servants $40,000, another servant came and said, if you would, sir, here is your 40,000. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Whew. Now, what would you say about the perception of the master now king that this servant expresses? You are a hard man. Did the previous 
interactions between the servants and the master make you think that he was a hard man? Or stingy? Or nasty? There's a perception problem going on in this interaction. This servant received the same trust from the master, but their perception of the soon-to-be king was this. Oh, this guy is bad news. He's hard. He's going to take it out of us. I better just like hide his gifts away so that if he's made king, I can at least give that back to him. Because who knows what this wild card of a guy is going to do. We don't even know if he's going to be king or not. Some people hate him. This servant's perception is wrong, wrong, wrong. They fail to understand the good intention and generous heart of the master. Here's what the master says to them. The master replied, Servant, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. Okay, this is harsh. And please notice what the master is not going to do is correct their perception. He's going to leave them right in the reality that they constructed for themselves. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in, reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you at least put my money on deposit so that when I came back and was king, I could have collected it with interest? And then he said to those standing by, take away his 40,000 and give it to the one who has 400,000. Well, sir, they said, he already has 400,000. Whew. Did I mention this is where the bad news of the story is? This is where it gets harsh. Amazingly, the king in the story, again, does not correct the wrong impression of this faithless servant. They did not use the master's resource to honor him while he was away didn't even invest it, did not promote his cause or reputation, nothing happened. They sat on it. Now, this is a frightening thing to me, that we might have wrong impressions of our good God, of our faithful Savior, and that God does not just snap his fingers and correct our bad theology does not correct our lousy impression of who God really is. This is why we need to come to church on a regular basis, by the way, and sing songs like hallelujah to our great God. Like it lifts our image of God from Santa Claus or some, I don't know, white bearded grandpa and reminds us that God is awesome and blinding in his holiness and eternal and mighty in his goodness. If you're suspicious that your picture of God is too small or too stingy, there are two things that you can do. God gave us this book. This book is meant to fill out our impression of who God really is. And if we're apart from this book, we will be sadly left to our own devices and our picture and image of God will shrink and shrink and shrink. The second thing we can do if you feel like, wow, my image of God is not big enough right now, we can pray and confess, God, I keep making my life Greg-sized. I keep thinking of you as human-sized. Please, stretch my imagination. I want to honor you more. Please, stretch the borders of my heart so that I can love you more. Please, stretch my mind so that I can comprehend more of your word and how beautiful and awesome you are. When you pray like that, God will answer that prayer and grow your heart and mind and capacity and spirit. God forbid that we live our lives like this crappy servant who just sat on the Creator's good gifts We need our hearts and capacities to grow. Amen? Anybody? (laughs) Jesus wants to light a bigger fire in your life. Jesus wants to kindle a bigger fire in this church. Jesus wants to start an inferno in the bigger church. Here's how the story ends, Jesus' parable of the piles of cash. Then the now king replied, I tell you, to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, 
even what they have will be taken away. And as for those enemies of mine who did not want to be me to be king over them, the detractors and the haters, bring them here and kill them in front of me. End of story. Jesus says, if you publicly represent him and honor him with the good gifts that God has put in your life, it's going to be a snowball of good momentum that keeps going from this life into eternity. The joy that you have now, you're going to have more joy. The generosity that you have now, you're going to have more and more and more. The love that you experience now, more. The friendship and connection that is just beginning now is going to be the most beautiful thing in God's forever life for all of us. But as for those people who choose to ignore the Creator's good gifts or don't care enough about the one who made them to ever honor them, or who maybe even recognize that Jesus is the savior and captain of their souls, but just let it be, there's no good momentum that happens. It's just stagnant, and then unwinding, and then destruction. Many of Jesus' parables have what I call cliffhanger endings, where, you're, where you wonder like, well, what's gonna happen next? Does the king really kill all these people? Because that might mean he really is a bad person. Jesus does not give us the execution scene. And I ask you, what would happen if in the story, the servant who sat on all their gifts said they were sorry and repented and asked for a second chance with the now new king? What do you think that new king would do? <laughs> Thank you, Brother Turner. He would give them a second chance. I think that's the spirit of the good king that we see in this story. He would give them another chance. What about for the people who hated this now king, who were the public detractors, who went around with signs and placards who said, we don't believe in this guy, we don't want him to be king. Hopefully Caesar like, <laughs> votes thumbs down on him. What if those people were like, hey new king, we misused our time, we were wrong. We're sorry that we even publicly witnessed against you. Who are we to do that? Please. What do you think this new king would do to even those who publicly hated him? A second chance. <laughs> There's harsh words at the end of the story, but the Jesus I know who told this story leaves the door open because no matter what has been part of our history, there is always a second chance. If you're squandering your life right now, friend, there is a, this is your moment. If you've sowed seeds of doubt about Jesus in yourself or in others, or been ashamed to publicly represent your king and savior, now is your moment of opportunity to say, Jesus, light a bigger fire in my heart. I don't want that to happen again. I wanna represent you. I wanna receive what you've given me, and I want it to shine. With all that in mind, I say, yes, Lord Jesus, whenever you wanna come back and be the king, for everybody to see and to bring the full kingdom that could not happen too soon for me. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we would ask for your help from your spirit today that you would find us faithful, that you would send fresh wind and fresh fire from your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and inspire us to lean into the second chance if that's what we need right now because we want to walk with you and walk your way. It's in your holy name that we pray and everybody says, amen. Church, we're gonna take an offering right now. Um, this is a, a weekly way for us to practice exactly this. Um, it is not about piles of cash. It is about our hearts saying with our gifts, 
and with our checkbooks. Yep, it's all for you, Jesus. If you are not on the inside of Jesus' kingdom right now, um, th that does not apply to you. Kind of wonder how this might apply to you. And again, if you are one of the people sitting here today who are maybe thinking, I have a gift or a talent, I would like to share this in a brighter way, please fill out that card and drop it in and make that your offering today. Aaron and the band are going to lead us while the offering happens. Take us away. <laughs>